Hey folks, if you're new or haven't done it yet, please do me an act of kindness and hit that subscribe button, it's absolutely free. While you're at it, hit the like and share out and tell your friends and family. Thanks so much for watching, God bless, and let's get into it. Here in the mountains of Appalachia, there's no shortage of strange occurrences and bizarre events. Stories of ghosts, mountain witches, old wood boogers, even time slips. Here in the mountains, there's no telling what you may encounter. My story happened in West Virginia in 1973. My daddy got laid off from his truck driving job, and my parents decided they was going to try their hand at farming. So they bought a 30-acre farm from my uncle, and we moved from the inner city neighborhood that I grew up in and moved down there. I was about eight at the time, so I didn't hold up too much hope for anything that I'd call fun. But, nobody asked my opinion. Well, we pulled into the yard, and we got out to look around. The barn was made of stone and looked like it'd survive a tornado. And some of the outbuildings needed a little repairing, but the chicken coop was in really bad shape. I asked my mom you know, where the house was. Well, she pointed at the chicken coop. I had my doubts, but... There was more open land than I had ever seen. I started to run off and my mama grabbed my arm. She started pointing at things saying, Don't go past that. Don't go near that. Don't do this and don't do that. Well, by the time she's done, all that was left was front yard. I really didn't mind because there was still more room than I was used to. Well, then she told me something that knocked me off my feet. She said that so long as we're living here, you gonna be in the house by dusk and in bed by dark. I started to protest, but she gave me the look, so I hushed up. We lived down there for about 10 months. Every night, something would come into our yard and try to get at the livestock. Our dogs usually chase them off. Now, they was about 80 pounds worth of pit bulls, and they didn't know what fear was. They once run off a bear, and I heard them running it down through the bottoms while Daddy and Brother shot their guns up in the air and shouted. We probably would have stayed there forever if it weren't for one night. It was early October. My parents was talking about sending a pig to the slaughterhouse and getting some jars to can the vegetables and the garden, things like that. They were supposed to go over the next day. So I was sent to bed early so we could get an early start down in town. Well, later that night, I woke up to the sound of the chickens a screeching in their pens. I look over to tell my brother that something's in the chicken pen, but he weren't there. I got up and walked into the living room and started to ask what's happening, but Mama put her finger up to her lips. She was sitting on the couch with my sister and her baby. They were there trying to keep him quiet. My daddy and brother was sitting on the kitchen chairs facing the front door with their guns in their laps. The chickens kept screeching. Then the hogs started squealing. That noise was horrible. Then I noticed the dogs weren't barking. 
I listened real close, and then I heard them whimpering under the porch. Suddenly, I heard one of them yelping and biting at something. I put my hands over my ears so I couldn't hear it anymore. Just then, everything went quiet. We strained to hear something, and then something stepped up on the porch. We heard the board straining as it walked across and stopped right at the front door. My dad and brother stood up and eased their guns up to their shoulders, aiming it right at the door. The knob turned and rattled a little bit, but the door stayed shut. When that thing started walking across the porch, no wood popping, and stepped down off the side of the house. This thing was circling the house. I got scared, so scared that I run to my bedroom, jumped into bed and pulled the covers up over my head. Next thing I knowed, it was morning. I got up and went into the front room. My mom and my sister was there, throwing everything we owned into bags, boxes, baskets, you name it. I asked them where Daddy was, and Mama yelled for me to get packing. I looked outside and wished I hadn't. The front yard was covered with feathers, blood, you name it. Turned out that my daddy had went to rent his U-Haul and to tell my uncle what was left of the farm was up for grabs. And we was back at the old neighborhood by nightfall. My parents, they didn't talk about that for the rest of their lives. In my little town of Mount Angel, it's pretty safe. You can walk around the whole town at night and not worry about anything happening to you. The police are always there driving around, waving. People are just good and kind. The families who live in my town are generational families. Once has been living there since the town was founded back in October 1882. Everybody, you know, pretty much knows everybody. Because it's so safe, and I'm such a busy person, I'll often get my exercise in at night, walking around town. Now, another thing about our town is that the people tend to turn in early, around 10 p.m. Most of the town is still and quiet. This is about eight years ago, and I started walking almost every night. And it was really helping me to gain stamina and build my strength. I often saw cats, dogs, possums, raccoons, and stuff on my walk. A month or two went by after starting and everything was going smoothly until one Friday night. I met a strange dog on the trek that I'd never seen before. It stood ahead of me across the road, just staring at me. It looked a little strange there, just standing odd, crooked-like in position. It had an uneasy feeling. But seeing that it was a dog, my first instinct was to call it over to me. I said, well, hi there, sweetheart, as I reached out my hand. The dog slowly started walking over to me, as it did. I told myself that it was just lonely and just wanted some lovings. But the truth was, I was scared. Now, I've never been afraid of a dog in my life till that night. Its presence just felt odd. As it come closer, I could see it better. I began to realize how different this dog really was. This dog had an extremely ugly face, like it had been leftovers from a butcher shop, or its face had been like melted like candle wax, yet the fur was covering it. Now, the dog was white, short hair. 
His legs were bold and his eyes were solid, shiny black. One eye was much smaller than the other. His ears were so small on the top of his head that they looked like they'd almost been bitten off. I told myself that it was just maybe badly bred or you know, maybe just by, you know, getting his hair back from having the mange. Well, I tried to have compassion for it, but this dog come walking over to me like it was a man. Not on its hind legs, on all fours, but its, its walk was just manly. It's hard to explain, but its head, shoulders, hips, everything moved like a man as it was walking over there to me. It also looked me directly in the eye without breaking contact. Talk about scary. Then once it got about six foot away from me, it stopped while it fixed its eyes into mine and just stood there staring at me. And as it stared at me, I became aware of the fact that the presence of this dog was actually that of a human. I mean, it was not a dog's, you know, little spirit that was there or anything. It was literally like human being in a dog's body. I could see it in my mind's eye, a real big, you know, maybe masculine woman with dark brown hair. I thought and then said, the Lord Jesus rebuke you and told it to stay back. I walked at a good pace and directed my legs back home. When I got home, I thought, what on earth? Well, the next night I was out walking, nothing happened. As the days went on, still nothing. I didn't see that dog again until the next Friday this time in another part of town, peering at me. Then slowly walked up to me. I told it to stay away from me, that I'm covered in Jesus Christ. I walked myself home. Then I didn't see that dog for a while, probably a month or two. Then I started seeing it more frequently, like every single Friday. Well, after about four or five of them Fridays, started paying attention to it and then started praying against it when I saw that you know, I tell you it had no power over me or this town I felt I should tell that dog to leave town so I did and I would say that every single time I saw it this dog was alarming I tell you this dog somehow inside was a human so after doing this for about six months or so, and praying every time I returned home, the dog disappeared, and I was not being met by it anymore on Friday nights. Just didn't see it anymore. Didn't have that bad looming feeling neither. So fast forward to a few weeks after not seeing the dog anymore, I was walking to a friend and neighbor of mine and we was discussing the upcoming festival that our little town holds every year. Then out of the blue, she told me something that she had heard from another friend of hers in town. Said that almost a year ago, a practicing witch had moved into the town. She was very unfriendly and stayed off to herself, except for when she once introduced herself at the town meeting. She sarcastically told everybody that was listening that she was there to spy, create problems, and cast spells. Well, most of the people laughing, thinking that she, you know, she was just joking. But nobody seemed to take her seriously or believe that she was even a witch. Well, turns out that out of the blue, and a few weeks before speaking to my friend, that witch got up and abruptly just moved away, leaving her house empty. 
and I ain't seen that dog ever since. Here's a creepy story that happened to me not long ago. I work hard Monday through Friday and look forward to my weekends. Now Sunday, that's my church going day and family day. But now my Saturdays, that's my fishing time. Well, I got up around 5 a.m. Saturday morning and I was out on the creek bank by 6. I was standing there, I'd cast it in a few times, it was kind of cool, there was a little bit of mist on the water, beautiful morning, real relaxing. Well, I changed my bait and threw out. As I was sitting there, I got to noticing something that I'd learned from your videos. Everything was silent. The water weren't rippling. The insects weren't making a noise. Nothing. Just silence. When all of a sudden from behind me, this thing is all I know to explain it. Come hopping close to me through the treetops. About middle ways up the tree, closer to the top ends. I couldn't see anything. But keep in mind, it was fairly well daylight. And it was coming closer. And whatever it was, I could tell by the sound. It was heavy. And it was big. If for the world, the only way I know to describe it. If you could picture a grizzly bear jumping from tree to tree. That's what it sounded like. You could hear limbs breaking, cracking, popping. Even hear the trees, some of them themselves, popping from swaying back and forth. And it stopped abruptly right behind me. And again, I looked straight up, and I saw nothing. But yet that big old tree was swaying. Well, while I'm standing there, just in complete awe, and curiosity had got the better of me. Something let out a screech-like scream. The only way I can think to describe it is if a grown man with a very deep voice had screamed and at the same time, a pterodactyl had screamed out. And it was so loud, I dropped my pole and grabbed my ears. It screamed out three times. I freed one hand off my ear and put my shoulder up to my ear. I rushed down, grabbed my tackle box, grabbed my line, grabbed my pole, and headed to the car. When I got to the car, I noticed no traffic, nothing. Still no crickets, no squirrels, anything. I got everything, just throwed it in the back seat. Usually I'd take my pole apart, put it in the trunk. Not today. This morning, everything just got slung in the back seat. I jumped in, throw the keys in the switch, and I heard it one more time. And for the world, as I was pulling out onto the road after I cranked up, I seen a limb sway to the left of me. Well, needless to say, I've never been back to that spot and have been warning everybody I can, don't go near it. Back some years ago, my wife and I took a vacation. We drove almost a half a day to get to Fall Creek Falls State Park, a place we had always heard about. We get up there and the sights is beautiful, people friendly, everything was picture perfect. Exactly or if not better than what we expected. 
We hit some of the nature trails, visited the nature center, let the kids play on the swings. Well, that afternoon, we was all tired. So, my oldest son agreed to watch his brother and sister. Well, by that evening, some more people had gathered in. The park was getting pretty thick. Well, we went and asked a local if there was any local sites. Well, they told us about a cave that weren't too far from there, just outside of the park. They told us the address, said they knew the people quite well, and say they sent us there to see the cave. Now, when we spoke with this person, I don't know, there was just something off about them. They just seemed a little too eager to, you know, they knew exactly what we wanted, what we was looking for, everything. But we just agreed and went on. We followed the directions and pulled up to an old rundown house. Older gentleman sitting out on the front porch. A couple of dogs laying out in the yard. Friendly old fella. Throwed his hand up. Real inviting. We walked up, shook hands, and told him what we was looking for. And he told us just to go around the side of the house, cross the backyard through the field, and follow the path. Said you couldn't miss it. Went straight up to that old cave. We take off, and it's absolutely beautiful. Some of the sights up through there were absolutely breathtaking. We stopped, even took a couple photos. We get up to the mouth of the cave, and we look around, stop and rest. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, after a few minutes, it started getting late, and we know we had to get back out of there before it got too dark to see, because we didn't have any flashlights with us, torches or anything. Well, by the time we made it about halfway back down the path, it was getting pretty dark on us. Darker than we expected and darker than we wanted. All of a sudden, we started hearing strange noises. Almost, for the world, sounded like people running. When that would happen, we would stop and turn around. We just knew it was locals messing with us. Maybe, you know, knowing some outsiders outside of town was there, wanting to mess with them, have a good laugh. Well, every time we would turn around, nothing. We'd turn, take off again. Same thing. We'd be directly behind us and alongside of us. About the third time it happened, we both turned around. And we saw the same thing at the same exact time. And it's something that shook us to our very core. We turned around and looked at each other. Never said a word. I rushed down and clasped her hand. She clasped mine. And we just took off almost in a fast pace. And we kept that up. Till we got back to the edge of the, the yard. We crossed the field into the yard, back to the car. As we passed the house going to the car, it was kind of strange. The person we spoke to at the park was standing there talking to the older gentleman, and they were laughing. We didn't think it was too funny. But after we got in the car and left, we got to talking about what we saw and the strangeness of the whole thing. As we was going through the path there, I said around the third time we heard it. When we turned around, we seen tons, and when I say tons, I mean literal tons of what looked like solid black shapes of people that was ducking behind the trees. I'm talking probably 40 to 50 maybe. 
maybe more. And they were moving at a pace that no human could move. Also, as we passed the house, we got to noticing the one that was at the park we spoke to that gave us the directions was there, and there was no other vehicles. Yeah, it's possible they got a ride, but still just kind of odd. Also, why were they laughing? But the strangest part is yet to come. At the end of our vacation, we all packed up, and we left. We were going to see another landmark before we left. Strangely, the directions took us right by the house, the house that led to the cave. As we drove by there, there were no signs of life anywhere. The no, no old man, no dogs. A fence was there that was gated off with a chain around it allowing no access with no trespassing signs. The house itself was old. Windows didn't have any kind of blinds, curtains on it or anything. Looked like it had been long since abandoned. My wife and I just looked at each other. And it weren't for a long time after that that we even told the kids. When my daughter was around seven years old, we attended a church that was somewhat far from our little town, which took us about an hour's drive to get there. On this particular morning, we were real excited to go for whatever reason I can't remember, but also just the fact that we loved to get there early so we could talk to friends and family before a service started. And we didn't want to miss any of the, you know, getting to sing the song. Well, for some strange reason, we had a string of Sundays where we arrived late. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why, since I would always give us plenty of time. As a mama, I blamed myself, and I just hated being late. Well, this time, I was extra careful to watch the clock even more. By George, we got distracted somehow, and were run late again. Very late. I began to hurry us into that car, and we sped off lickety-split heading to church, which was about an hour away. As we came into a familiar bridge, about 15 minutes into our one-hour drive, I couldn't help but feel bad and Tears began to stream down my face. I told the Lord that he is important to me, and so are his other children at the church. Also, I told him that I was so sorry that we was going to be late again and miss worshiping for the sermon. My little daughter heard me say these things. She reached out and grabbed my hand and said, Mama, we can ask Jesus to help us get there on time. Even though it seemed impossible, I was desperate. At this point, we was at a stoplight at the bottom of the bridge there, which went uphill. Well, we said a very simple prayer to the Lord. So, Lord Jesus, please help us get there on time. Well, then the light turned green, and we proceeded up and over the bridge. Well, somehow, some way, when we crossed over that bridge, we were immediately at the bottom of the hill leading up to the church. There was a whole load of driving that we did not remember doing that morning. Just skipped it all. We both said, what? Now hang on now, this ain't right. It was such a shock because they were just pretty much, you know, we were just there. Well, the tears on my face hadn't even dried yet. It hadn't even taken us 15 minutes to get there, all together, and we were early. 
the most amazing joy come over us, and we knew that we were loved by the good Lord, and that's all it took. No, the Lord didn't give us a bunch of money. He didn't make all of our dreams come true. What he did do was rest into our hearts and let us know the most peculiar way that he's with us and that he loves us so much. He also did another miracle for us because from that day on, we was never late to church again.